very early on in the universe, there was a state where the density and temperature of matter is so great that its effect, the effect of that matter on space-time is so extreme that we can't use Einstein's theory of space-time, Einstein's theory of gravity there anymore. And there, we have no agreed that upon its effect the theory the, of what people call quantum gravity to describe physics at that moment or before that moment. So for me, the Big Bang is where our current explanations end and we need new physics. So, Ben, um, this, is, this show, then, is the show that begins where our knowledge stops. Is it problematic? Why are you, why are you, why are you addressing this? <laughs> this ben, ben I can rephrase it for you. What do you think it is about the part of Hamlet that has made it so <laughs> alluring for so many actors? Well, I think it's the way it can be interpreted in a, in a, in a number of different uh, social contexts. I think that's basically my theory. <laughs> I wonder, Richard, I was, I was going to ask you, I mean, one of the things that some people are kind of, I suppose, to an extent, anti-science people go, oh, well, they haven't even worked out how the universe began. But as far as I know, they've got, I'm, I'm not up to date on this, but the last I read, we were up to the first 10 to the minus 37 of a second, which isn't a bad start, you know. And so what, you know, what, what, when you were studying 25 years ago, you know, how many changes have we seen in the, in the last kind of two and a half, three decades of our understanding of the Big Bang since you were looking at that area? Oh, there's so much has been discovered and so much has changed. Indeed, even this year, there have been advances in what we understand about the, the, the microwave, uh, cosmic background microwave radiation, and, and that's how we know about the Big Bang, because it's the remnant of that explosion. Even in the last few months, there have been advances. So it's weird that something that happened 13 billion years ago is actually topical at the moment. Carlos, if we start... Uh, um, so, the Big Bang cosmology now, so the, the standard textbook uh, description of what we do know about the, the, the universe, the evolution of the universe after it began. Could you give us a brief sort of one or two minute summary of the, the textbook explanation of what we know? Yeah, because I think we started on the gloomy uh, footing here when uh, we started stating our ignorance, when in fact we have a lot of knowledge as well about what our universe has got itself up to in the last 13.7 Richard, um, billion years. So what, what we do know, even though we don't know exactly what happened at the Big Bang, and indeed maybe Hamlet might have asked what actually went bang, we don't have an answer to that, but we do understand quite a lot of what the universe has been doing. So, for example, we know that early on the universe was very foggy, uh, and um, when it was foggy, it decided to make some of the chemical elements that eventually found their way into our bodies. So we are mostly made of water. The hydrogen in the water actually was made, much of it, in the Big Bang. So we know, in fact, how these chemical elements were, were synthesized in the early universe. We know also that when the fog lifted, it revealed the early phases of the universe, and that uh, has been seen directly because when the fog lifted, this uh, radiation uh, that was present in the early moments of the Big Bang traveled towards us, and this radiation was discovered in the 1960s and told us that the universe had indeed begun in this very hot, then state. So we know about the chemical elements. We know about what we call the microwave background radiation, which is the heat left over from the Big Bang. And we know, of course, that the universe is expanding. So all these three lines of empirical evidence point to the fact that very early on, 13.7 billion years ago, something very exciting happened, which is when a universe was born. So even though we don't quite know how it was born or exactly what happened then, we know a lot about what a universe has been doing, and this is something that astronomers routinely verify with astronomical observations. So how's that for a minute of two uh, synth synthesis of 13.7 billion years of cosmic evolution, Brian? That's, well, that's I'll tell you what, really we've had a call from Nicholas Parsons. You've passed the audition, and uh, <laughs> just a minute on... Um, Faye, what I was wondering is... what. That, that 10 to the minus 37, which might, it might be less than that now, I'm not entirely sure, but how is that being investigated now? How, uh, and how confident, I know it's a very difficult question to ask scientists, that we will, with biologists, of course, with life, uh, they say, well, we may well never be able to define exactly when life began and, and what we would constitute as life. With the beginning of the universe, that 10 to the minus 37, it's such, a, you know, it's such an incredibly small amount of time. How, how are we able to investigate the potential of why the universe exists as it does? So this problem of quantum gravity, how to reconcile Einstein's theory of gravity with quantum theory, 
it's a problem, not a theory. So when I say quantum gravity, it's not, a, it's not any theory that we have agreed upon and that we're investigating. It's a problem, and there are many different approaches for making progress with that problem. But they are all, each one of them, speculative. So we don't have any agreement in the physics community that one is the right one. Um, and it's in, exactly in cosmology where those ideas are going to be tested. The regimes at which quantum gravity effects are important are very, very extreme. They're on the tiniest scales, and the beginning of the universe is one of the regimes where quantum gravity effects um, could show themselves, and the effect that those quantum gravity effects could have on the subsequent evolution of the universe are things that we could go out and test and look for. Now, Carlos, we, we talk about this, uh, the, the Big Bang, the, the, this hot, dense initial state. Um, now, in some sense, um, some physicists will use a different form of language there and say, well, before that hot, dense state, there was something which we, gener- we know about and is generally accepted, which is the theory of inflation. So could, could you perhaps just sketch out the theory of inflation, which is the, the, the expansion period before this hot, dense state and the more usual expansion with which we're familiar? Yes. So may I uh, disagree slightly with Brian Cox, which is a dangerous thing to do. I'm not quite sure this semantics, what was there before and what was after, it becomes unclear. Because in my picture of the universe, the Big Bang happened, and then soon after this period of inflation happened. Now, of course, it can get much more interesting because I will tell you what inflation is in a minute, but one of the side effects of inflation is that it could be new banks. And in fact, there could be a hell of a lot of new banks. In fact, an infinite number of new banks. So, but there was like a, the father of all banks or the mother of all banks, which is what I'm going to call the big bang. And then when that universe was born, it turned out that it wasn't really in a kind of... Um, relaxed state. It had, like a teenager, excess energy that the universe had to shake off somehow. And it did it by expanding very, 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 very rapidly, such that it grew from the size of a proton, which is a tiny elementary particle, to the size of a football in a wink of an eye, in 10 to the minus 35 seconds. So we call this inflation. And this period of inflation then Eventually, when the energy of the teenage energy, if you like, the energy was exhausted, then the universe started expanding more gradually. Now, that's the theory of inflation. And inflation is a wonderful theory that has pretty much been verified by experiment, amazing as it may sound, because we're talking here about events that occurred when the universe was a mere 10 to the minus 35 seconds old. That's a decimal point, 34 zeros, and a 1 that fraction of a second, that's when inflation happened. And amazingly, we can actually test that that did indeed happen. And one last uh, uh, thing I want to say about inflation, because one of the great successes of the field I'm absolutely privileged to work in, and I regard myself as one of the luckiest human beings that I've been able to spend my working life in in this subject, is that uh, we're beginning to understand how galaxies, for example, came to be, Galaxies, which of course are very important for us because without galaxies there would be no stars, without stars there would be no planets, and without planets there would be no Robin and no Brian uh, and none of the panel here. So it turns out that the origin of galaxies goes back to inflation itself because inflation was produced by these things we call quantum phenomena, and the quantum world, uh, everything is fluctuating all the time, and some of these little fluctuations became ingrained in the universe as it expanded uh, at this very early age and eventually ended up producing galaxies and eventually producing us. And so that is um, uh, what inflation did, and it is one of the greatest intellectual constructs of humanity, the fact that we can begin to link up what we see in our telescopes today with phenomena that happen when the universe was just that tiny fraction of a second old. It's very... Because often, with some physicists, there's, there's been a kind of damning of ideas of philosophy. And, uh, hello, Brian. And uh, the, I just, some, there is a point where you do seem, with some of these ideas, that there is a, a moment where physics does return to being metaphysics, where mm. things become thought experiments, where, where it is that, that level of philosophy. Richard, I wonder how you feel about that. 
Well, I have a controversial view, which is that the, the big picture of the order of events at the start of the universe have been revealed to us in a coded form uh, in the lyrics of a popular song in the early 60s, just before the discovery of the background microwave radiation. Um, of course, I'm referring to Tommy Steele, flash, bang, wallop, what a picture. <laughs> which, if you put big in front of everyone, you've got the big flash, then the big bang. We're still waiting for the big wallop, but that could be dark energy. <laughs> do you know what? I'm not sure. I think that might be Little White Bull that you've just said there. The, uh, do you know what? I don't think Radio 4 has had two references to Tommy Steele so close together in the last 20 years. Well done. Mother. The, <laughs> well, Carlos, you, you mentioned there, we, we shouldn't move on to, you, it, almost in passing, you, you, we talked about inflation, which is, I suppose, the textbook model at the moment. This inflationary yeah. expansion, 10 to minus 35 seconds after the Big Bang and so on. But then you, you just mentioned in passing that there might also be an infinite number of universes. And, <laughs> and so yes. Just to outline how it is that we might speculate that inflationary cosmology implies that there may, may be more than one universe, and in fact, an infinite number. Yeah, no, infinity always kind of gives me the desire to scratch my head. I don't know if I get a rash or what it is when uh, <laughs> infinity... Yeah, infinite, infinite, infinity is big. Big, big, big. <laughs> and the, uh, so I worry about infinity. It's much bigger than my brain, I'm sure, of that. So, but yes, so, so it turns out, sadly for me, and I hope for most of you, that if these ideas of inflation are correct, then because inflation is associated with these quantum things, and quantum things fluctuate all the time, then it may well be that once the mother of all big banks happened and inflation then followed, that as part of inflation, there were more quantum fluctuations that created a new universe and um, distinct from ours, which inflated as well. And because there was still some leftover of this uh, vacuum energy I was talking about before, it would fluctuate again and again and again and again and again. And we could be in a situation where there isn't one universe or two or two, three or any number I can count, but an infinite number of universes. But that's bad enough. Trouble is, if these <laughs> ideas are correct, there are an infinite number of universes being born all the time. So this is something that is quite respectable. Uh, so respectable that the two people who thought about this uh, just got a big million-dollar prize uh, called the Cadley Prize. And... I was on the committee that gave the prize, maybe a mistake, because I couldn't give it to myself, but I gave it to <laughs> Alan Guth and uh, Andre Lindy and somebody else called Alexis Starobinsky precisely for these ideas. So they're respectable ideas. And the, um, it goes by the name of eternal inflation. Very nice name. Uh, fundamental physicists like uh, Faye over there like to use these words when they don't understand something, dark energy, dark matter, eternal inflation. But it is uh, <laughs> part, uh, part of inflation... The dark side of inflation is that it does naturally fit in with this idea that we're not alone. But let me say, if you think you want to go on holiday to one of these other universes, forget it. You'll never be able to get there because there's no way we can communicate with these other universes. And so, uh, Robin, this is really now at the interface between the science. I love physics and uh, uh, Richard here. Uh, talking about metaphysics. So it, it, it is along in the boundary of the two. But I think it's quite likely that these ideas may well turn out to be right, but we will, unless fate tells us, never know for sure. Sorry? I just think that holidays in other universes, they, they lose your luggage when you go to Brussels. <laughs> let alone kind of, I, mean, I, I mean, Ben, you've, you've written a, a, book, a book which was explaining a lot of big scientific ideas. And I'm just amazed, in some ways, the nonchalance of what's going on here, which is one, we've been talking for a moment, where the fact that everything, everything that everyone is made of here, everything is, was some type, it was the size of a football, it was smaller, it was smaller, it was smaller than that. And also the idea that the universe might be of an infinite size, which would then give us an infinite number of different versions. I mean, this means that we all exist somewhere else in the universe if that was true. And then there's an infinite number of other universes as well with every other possibility. How on earth can you manage to fit that in a brain? How can we manage to explain that to people and in any way kind of take that on? Well, I like it because it means that somewhere I finished my PhD. <laughs> <laughs> Not just in one place, as well, in loads of places you did finish it. You're downside. just the lazy Ben Miller in this universe. <laughs> but, yeah, but on the downside, you didn't get that award for a student Hamlet. <laughs> 
but he finished <laughs> an infinite number of PhD theses as well, an infinite number of times. Well, I think um, this is where Hamlet comes in, isn't it? Hamlet is essentially about the unknowability. You know, uh, Hamlet wants to know uh, who killed his, his father and finds that essentially unknowable and feels unable to act because he doesn't have the information to be able to take a decision. And uh, luckily, in uh, science, we have experiments, so we can actually go and look and we can measure things and we can try and convince ourselves of one opinion or another. So uh, unlike Hamlet, we have uh, evidence. I find it a fascinating idea that, as, as Carlos said, as you said, um, the, the inflationary cosmology is probably the standard model of cosmology at the moment, although there are people, I think, fair, you perhaps disagree with that, don't you, in a sense, but it's... Yes, it, I'm, a, it, I'm an inflation sceptic, Carlos. I don't think that the inflationary model is something which we can say is we have strong enough evidence for that we know it. That we you know take it the price away there. from Alan and, and Andre, the million <laughs> no, dollars. No, no, it's a good idea. It's very clever. It's a good idea. I'm just saying that in terms of its, its status as understood and agreed upon science, it doesn't, yeah, it, to me it's not, well, it's not as well founded as other things that we, that we say are, we're sure of, like, general relativity, for example. Is it true that if anyway, inflation... Anyway, and also, Sorry. you dissed me. I, I like it that you... Yeah, <laughs> yeah, this is what we needed. You, you dissed me as a theoretical physicist having abstract ideas, and you're the one talking about infinitely many universes and infinitely yeah. many big bangs and... I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Brian asked me the question. I have to answer it. I have to <laughs> respond to Brian. But, but no, I, I mean, I think I have a day job. I, I, I look for dark matter and I figure out how galaxies form and I simulate the universe. That's my day job. <laughs> my day job is figuring yeah. out how yeah. galaxies yeah. form. <laughs> I occasionally make yeah. the odd one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but surely during the day you can't see the stars. Well, no, that's right. That's why, that's why yeah. <laughs> I think. But, you know, weekends I'm allowed to think about... Um, the infinite monkey, the infinite uh, universe. <laughs> <no? laughs> so, Richard, what do you do? You want to... well, is it true that if inflation gets above 2.5%, the Astronomer Royal has to write a letter of apology to the Charter of the Exchequer? <laughs> to God. <laughs> to but, God, yeah. But, but I'll you... tell you one thing. When I came back to the UK, as you can tell from my majority accent, I'm not from Durham, but <laughs> the, uh, I, I was a postdoc and, uh, at the University of Sussex, and I get a phone call one day, uh, and I pick up the phone. So it's 10 Downing Street. Mm. And they said, Mrs. Thatcher, the Prime Minister, is very interested in science. She, she was a chemist. And uh, we're looking around for a scientist who will be able to talk about something exciting. And they've told us that you do kind of exciting things. Can we come and talk to you? And I must admit, I wasn't a great fan of Thatcher then. I'm not, I'm not now either. But 10 Downing Street, all right. So I said to these fellows, OK, come along. Uh, I'll tell you about my research. So these men, I've never seen people dressed like on the television, you know, pinstrip suits and umbrellas and briefcase, the whole lot. They came and, uh, into my office, and um, most physicists tend to wear slightly informal clothes, to say the least. So anyway, these two gentlemen sit down and say, very good, Dr. Frank, as I was there. What do you work on? I said, well, I work on trying to understand the universe, and uh, I work on how galaxies form. That, you know, something very exciting that's just happening now is that we now think we understand the origin of galaxies. Oh, yes, what is that? So, well, that is the, the theory of inflation. The faces dropped. <laughs> there was no more questions. As soon as they were uh, able to politely say goodbye, they got up, they left, and I never heard back from them. So I always wonder what it was that I said that was wrong, that offended uh, 10 Downing Street there. But I think it must have been something to do with inflation. Oh, it ben. disappoints me that all these people with PhDs aren't taking this subject seriously. <laughs> <laughs> Because what I want to know... I mean, one of the things that interests me about the multiverse... is well, it helps One of the only things that interests you <laughs> about the infinite number of... One of, of the universes. many things, Brian. Uh, one of the many things that interests me about the multiverse... About reality. But about it preoccupies my mind at this moment, shall we say that, is uh, the fact that we're here talking about it. And, um, you know, it's very hard to imagine, isn't it, how something started in a very hot, dense, presumably random state ended up... Uh, in this great sense of, in this dignified sense of order we find amongst us today. Um, and in particular, you know, Robbie, you were talking about uh, our ability, the ability of our brains to understand some of these ideas and the great organisation that that must take within, um, you know, within our, 
uh, within our bodies and within our chemistry, our, our biochemistry. And what interests me about the multiverse is that's a possible explanation for that, isn't it? Because then there would exist other universes where there weren't people alive to um, host popular uh, programs about science. And uh, heaven forbid, Ryan. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> not, well, people who could talk loquaciously without having to point at things. It's a, it's, a good, it's, it's, a good, it's a good question, actually. Is it, as Ben says, is that a sufficient... We're asking the question, what happened before the Big Bang? We're asking questions about, I suppose, the, the, the cause of, of existence, in a sense. That's what that question means. So is it conceivable that that will always be beyond science? Or is it, is it truly a scientific question? And if it's scientific, is there any way we're making progress towards an answer? I have complete confidence in science and I the from our experience so if you look back throughout history the things that we understand now couldn't have been conceived a few hundred years ago what the things that we understand the things that we have discovered they're really immense and I have to say that we haven't been trying very hard and we haven't been trying for very long to understand the universe. If you get you know, out of the 13.7 billion years, if you think about the, the tiny proportion of that that we've, we've actually been having a go at science, it's very tiny. And if you think about the proportion of the population of the world that has ever existed, I mean, just take human beings, the proportion of the population of the world who've had the opportunity to explore these ideas and have had the leisure time and the organisational ability to explore these ideas, that's also very tiny. So we've done enormously well, I mean, staggeringly well, given that we haven't been trying very hard and we haven't been trying for very long. And I, I have <clears throat> no doubt that we will understand much, much more. I mean, I think we can't now conceive of, even conceive of the, the things that we will understand in the future. Just the history of science teaches us that. So it's almost, I don't, yeah... I, and every, every discovery in science so far, so again, using history as our guide, every discovery in science has not closed a door. We've never come to the end of any line of inquiry. It's always opened the door to new questions that haven't even been thought before. Questions that you didn't even know were there are now there when you make a big discovery. And I think that there's no reason at all to ever to doubt that that, will, that process will come to an so, end. I, I just wonder when Carlos was saying about the teenage phase of the universe, about whether now the idea of the universe having a kind of sentient, self-aware creature investigating, that that's kind of the midlife crisis of the universe, and then that'll over and be done with. Because this is, again, the intriguing thing where we're talking about, as you said, you can't you know, go on holiday to other universes. Mm. So... How far do we ever get beyond it just being a thought experiment? The fact, Richard, that there are an infinite number of views according to this, you know, this, this, we know this is proper science, it's one money. So, the, you know, that's <laughs> how... Th th that, th does that go beyond a thought experiment? Do we ever see, you know, th is there something beyond that where you go, this now, the way we can view our views, has an incredible ramification for us as human beings? Well, I think the fascinating thing... People mentioned quantum fluctuations before. I'm not quite sure what they are, but basically in quantum physics, things kind of appear out of nowhere and they exist for a bit and they do things like they exchange forces or something, then they disappear again. So in a sense, the universe could have just come from nothing. It's like a, a payday loan. And we're sort of living on borrowed time. And, and, it, and eventually it, it may collapse back or it may go out again. But the fact is that we're all a kind of a transient of something which came from nothing and might well go back to it is quite a nice thought, really. Yes, yeah, so Carlos, we, the, the idea that um, Faye has been rather optimistic, the sense that, uh, and I would share the optimism, that if, if there is going to be an answer to this, it will come from science. But the, 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 the multiverse, the, this infinite number of universes idea, is it, really, a, a, it's not a particularly satisfying answer, is it? You're almost we're saying, well, every possible universe occurs, there's no particular explanation for the, the laws of physics in this one other than their one possible set of laws of physics and they're all made manifest somewhere and that's the reason that we exist in a sense because we have to, because everything exists that can. Mm. I mean, well, how, how does that make you feel? Is, 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 that, is that a good thing? I, I don't get a warm feeling inside me when we talk about this. However, th there is a very attractive uh, proposition uh, associated with the... Um, with the multiverse. Well, one, I already mentioned that if inflation did happen, it's almost inevitable that a multiverse would be with us. 
But the other aspect that um, uh, many people find very attractive, I, I must say I personally remain agnostic about this, and, and that is this. So Robin here, among the many words that um, he uh, uttered at the beginning, he just kind of dropped, name dropped, dark energy. Now, so dark energy is, is something that was discovered by uh, uh, physicists uh, in 1998. They got the Nobel Prize for that uh, a couple of years ago. And dark energy is a newcomer to the cosmic scene. It's something that we know our universe has, and it's causing the universe to accelerate at a faster, to expand at a faster and faster rate. So we know it's there, but we have no idea of what it might be. Now, theoretical physicists, um, like Faye, sit down when they hear about this and do a calculation. And the simple calculation you would do about the size of this dark energy, you come out with a number, and the number turns out to be 10 to the 120 times wrong. Now, she talked about the most accurate prediction of physics ever. This is the most inaccurate prediction in physics <laughs> ever. So it tells us there's something we don't understand. So we have no idea where the dark energy comes from. One possible explanation is that in order for us to be here, uh, in order for life to prosper, we know the universe has to have certain attributes. It has to live long enough. It has to make stars. It has to make all chemical elements and all these things that we know and love. Now, it may well be that dark energy is required for these conditions to pertain. And it might be that of all the possible multiverses where everything goes, only maybe ours, or maybe a handful, or maybe a large number, have the conditions required for dark energy and therefore for life to exist. So some people, this goes by the anthropic principle, namely that the laws of physics are what they are, because if they were any different, we wouldn't be here to be asking about the laws of physics. Now, I am agnostic about the anthropic principle because I, I think it's a valuable, it's a valid way of reasoning, but it should be the last resort of physicists. When you've run out of explanations, this would be the last resort. And so uh, that's another attractive uh, uh, side of, of the multiverse, and maybe it explains, as you say, why we're here. This is really warming up now to being the kind of Foreman versus Alley rumble in the jungle between think, Faye think, well, you're and the, Carlos. So, you're Faye, now comment. over to you for the punch. <laughs> So, in fact, that discovery of the expa accelerated expansion of the universe that was made in 1998 had been predicted. So, though that a prediction had been made that such an expansion would be discovered of that order of magnitude using a theory of quantum gravity, and that was made by a physicist called Raphael Sorkin, a theoretical physicist. <laughs> <laughs> and he used an argument based on a hypothesis about quantum gravity that space-time is fundamentally grainy or atomic. And using that idea and the idea that dark energy, because it should be a quantum phenomenon and therefore itself subject to quantum fluctuations and therefore can't be zero, he made an estimation of how big this, this dark energy component of the universe should be. And the estimation turned out to be right on the money. And he made that. It was a real prediction. He made the prediction in the late 80s, early 90s. And it turned out to be correct. And that idea of granular and atomic space-time, I think, <coughs> received a great deal of, um, of, um, of support from this verified prediction. And it's even more exciting than that. And I have to tell you this, because you won't have heard this in the popular press, and you'll be some, the first people to hear about this. There are now indications coming from a fantastically clever experiment whose acronym is BOSS. So I think people could do some kind of analysis of some of these acronyms, BOSS, BICEP, there's an acronym MACHO. Anyway. <laughs> so this experiment is called BOSS, which stands for Baryon Oscillation Spectroscopic Survey. And they've just put out a couple of papers, and more, de more papers are, are in the pipeline. And what they have done is they've used... It's very difficult to do cosmology because you don't know how far away things are. When you see things, they might be dim because they're just dim. They don't give out much light, or because they're far away. And when you see things which are small, you don't know whether they're small because they are small or whether they're just far away and look small. So you need what are called standard candles and standard rulers, things that you know how bright, intrinsically bright they are or how intrinsically big they are at, during, uh, at the Big Bang, so during the hot, dense stage of the universe. 
So sound waves travel in this plasma, and they travel a certain distance until the moment when the cosmic microwave background radiation um, is formed that we see. So that, that's, a stand, that's a standard distance, it's a standard ruler. And the BOSS experiment uses that, and that sound horizon imprints itself upon not just the microwave background radiation, but also on the, the distribution of galaxies that we see. And they have measured this distribution of galaxies using... There was a shaking of the head. Um, <laughs> that, that, very, I'm going to wrap up so, really quickly. Well, I, 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 I just wanted to ask Ben about this. We've you got know, three minutes when, when, you, when you hear the, the you know, these are, 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 are beautiful, sometimes very enigmatic kind of ideas. Is there ever a point where you think, do you know what, it was so much easier when the universe just began as a cosmic egg or we were just balanced on the back of an elephant and some turtles? <laughs> it's a turtle. Yeah, we should bring back some of those old myths, shouldn't we? Uh, great, yeah. They, uh, I mean, yes, yes, you know, turtles. I think that makes a lot more sense. All the way down. I'm, I'm going to yeah. go around. I want, I want a one word and well, two words, one word answer to each of these two questions. That's two words. Uh, Faye, I'll start with you. Are there turtles. an infinite number of universes <laughs> and is our existence inevitable? Two words. I don't like the idea of infinity. I can't get my head around it. So, okay, so I would say no to that one. What was the other question? Is our existence inevitable? No. I ben. can't believe you as a scientist are now doing a yes-no game. Ben. That's so... Again, it's always maybe or perhaps. Or the equations tell us perhaps exactly. maybe so. What do you think? Infinite number of universes? I don't know, but I think we are all in the imagination of some huge turtle sunning itself in a neutrino blast from a... <laughs> yes. Fill-in-the-blank... Who never got well, his PhD? Oh, well, Carlos that's, is furious. That's because Carlos not just said true. he believes it's the dreams of an elephant. Richard, and we've got no time to Richard. go to him. Um, well, I read this week that the whole Big Bang theory is in trouble anyway, because all the stars have asked for too much money. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the, the answer is I don't know. But let me just say one more thing. In, in, the, <laughs> in the times of Shakespeare, thunder, lightning, and rain were a matter of witches. Today, it's part of science. We don't know whether the universe is infinite or not. That's metaphysics today, but one day it will become part of science. I loved your Columbo style. Just one more thing on dark energy. Uh, so we asked our audience as well. So maybe one of them has got the ultimate answer. Here's, here's hoping. This is, um, what would you like to imagine existed before the Big Bang? Oh, here we are. What would you like to... A, a universe made entirely of Brian Cox's hair. So that returns to string theory. Um, the Archers. <laughs> An empty plain white room with Nicholas Parsons simply waiting for the next universe to begin. <laughs> so, uh, with a scientific a, answer there. Th thank you to our panel, Professor Freydauker, Professor Carlos Frank, Dr Richard Wrench and Mr Ben Miller. <laughs> next, week, next week is the final show in the series and we'll be asking, is being an idiot genetic? Well, actually, what... <laughs> What we're actually going to be asking is whether irrationality is an integral part of being a human or could there be a future where we all become cold, cold, clinical versions of ourselves where everyone is no more than a cyborg keyboardist who has clearly bought hair. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> thank you, goodbye. An infinite number of you God help us Over in CERN They are trying to learn What can the dark matter be? Who gives a fig If a pig can do trig In the infinite monkey cage that was the Infinite Monkey Cage podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. Did you spot the 15 minutes that was cut out for radio? Hmm. Anyway, there's a competition in itself. What, you think it should be more than 15 minutes? Shut up, it's your fault. You downloaded it. Anyway, there's other scientific programmes also that you can listen to. Yeah, there's that one with uh, Jimmy Alka-Seltzer. Scientific. Life Scientific. There's Adam uh, Rutherford, his dad discovered the atomic nucleus. That's Inside, inside science, science, All in the Mind with Claudia Hammond. Richard Hammond's sister. Richard Hammond's sister, thank you very much, Brian. And uh, also... <laughs> <laughs> I will sue. You can sue me, I need my career to have a lift. So, uh... <laughs> Today we're asking, can science save us? And indeed, should science save us? Yes, it can and no. Right, there we go, that's the whole show dealt with again very quickly. Uh, so, there was a monk who uh, once said to Richard Feynman, and we don't quote monks enough on our predominantly rationalist science show, but there, there was a monk who once said to Richard Feynman that the keys to heaven also open the gates to hell, uh, which is a terrible security system, by the way. You would think, <laughs> you'd think a deity would come up with something better than that, to be honest. <laughs> In other words, 
Might our ever-deepening knowledge of the workings of nature also lead to our downfall, or might it be the only route to our survival? Right, well, we know the answer to that, but for BBC regulations, we're not allowed to say. <laughs> so, hopefully our panel also know the answer, so let them introduce themselves. Uh, hello, I'm, I'm Stephen Fry. Uh, I'm from five minutes in the future. And um, I would save the world, well, as I told you five minutes ago. Um, <laughs> I would save the world. There are a lot of people like me who have slightly more adipose deposit than is necessary. <laughs> and, um, and there are plenty of need, there's a huge need for more energy. So we just need a way of siphoning the fat out of people like me and burning it. And I think, you know, just the Midwest of America alone could fuel <laughs> the rest of the world for at least a decade while we worked on, on nuclear uh, fusion. So that's my solution to saving the world. You, you can't be from five minutes in the future due to the hyperbolic geometry of space-time. <laughs> no. The reason you can't be from any time in, in the... Oh, hang on. It's <laughs> yeah, minus, okay. It's a minus sign in the metric. Yeah, all right. OK. I'm from five minutes in the past, as I'm about to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, I'm Tony Ryan. I'm a Pro Vice-Chancellor at the University of Sheffield, and I'd like to save the world by convincing the people that the planet will do just fine without them. <laughs> Just uh, as a matter of interest, you're a pro vice chancellor. Is, is there such a thing as an amateur <laughs> vice chancellor? <laughs> Could I apply? Be believe, believe me, I have lots of colleagues who are amateur vice chancellors. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is the best panto audience we've ever had. <laughs> He always said something against humans. I'm turning on this. You can't be from Sheffield because of the hyperbolic nature of Spenner. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, I'm Lucy Green. I'm a solar scientist at UCL. I can't promise to save the world, even if from the sun, but in that case, I will know about it eight minutes before everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's correct. <laughs> <laughs> now... Uh, I'm Eric Idle. I am a solographer. And I would save the world by Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> and this is our 